I am pleased to get a chance to uh, sort of kick off our semester here in Talbot Chapel. And as I, as I reflect sort of back on the, the first part of this new year, a new semester starting yesterday, if you've, been, if you've been paying much attention to the news, it's not hard to see that culturally we are in uncertain times that have lots of groups and lots of individuals nervous. With the election, the start of a new administration, there's considerable anxiety about where the current administration is heading and what the future holds. And I think that anxiety is held, in some cases, regardless of who a person voted for. I think this is especially true if you are an immigrant or culturally if you are a Muslim or a person of color or particularly this week, someone seeking asylum to come to the United States. I think it's, un it's understandable that culturally there is some nervousness and anxiety and uncertainty about where our, where our current administration is headed and what that means for our country. And as many of you are aware, institutionally, our school has faced some very uncertain times in the last year. As, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, over the last year to 18 months, we were the target of Senate Bill 1146, which I think is fair to say created considerable uncertainty among us, a bill that would have had profound impact on our ability to accomplish our mission. Thankfully, though the bill technically passed, thankfully all of the potentially damaging provisions of the bill had been removed prior to its passing. Around the university, I think the consensus is that we're pretty sure that the legislature is ramping up for another run at Christian schools in the next few years. And that creates lots of uncertainty, even though our president, Dr. Corey, has been very successful at building bridges to the LGBT community, which in my view gives us lots of good reasons to be hopeful and optimistic about this going forward. Now, as you start a new semester, you may be facing uncertain times personally. If you're graduating this spring, you may have lots of uncertainty about what you will be doing after graduation, and that may even be magnified depending on your particular field. You may be facing uh, financial uncertainty trying to figure out how you will make it financially while you're in school. Or you may face uncertainty in your family back home, relational uncertainty. There may be academic uncertainty. Or you may face uncertainty as a new student, or even as a minority student, wondering if this is the right place for you. You may even face uncertainty about your faith. So this semester, I want to start us off with the realization that though we may face uncertainty in a variety of different ways, we, we have a certain God. We are connected to a certain God who walks with us through these uncertain times. Now, if you have a Bible with you, uh, turn to the 13th Psalm. And in however you're reading your Bible, either old school or uh, digitally, if you don't have a Bible, you terrible, hopeless sinner. <laughs> Just kidding. Let's read together in Psalm, in Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes for I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. 
Now, let's, I think in Psalm, in Psalm 13, David faced uncertain times. In fact, I think that would be quite an understatement to say that he faced uncertain times. I think it'd probably be more accurate to say that the roof of his life was caving in at the moment. This is one of about, oh, probably 40% of the book of Psalms, known as the Lament Psalm. And the fact that it's a lament psalm, I think, suggests that there were lots of things that were not going particularly well for David at this point in his life. He was at this time on the run for his life from King Saul. You may re remember from the book of 1 Samuel, uh, he had been told that he was going to be the next king of Israel. <coughs> It had been announced to his family <coughs> excuse me, that the next king was going to come from the family of his father, Jesse. But his family didn't even think highly enough of him to present him as one of the viable candidates to be king. And when Samuel said, David, you are the man, uh, he was just as surprised as his family was. But then, not long after that, he goes out, and in this incredible act of courage and valor, he slays Goliath, defying all the odds, and the Israelites vanquished the Philistines who had been tormenting them for decades. And he, I suspect he thought that he was going to just sort of slide in from that victory over Goliath and the Philistines into this smooth transition as being the next king. What he discovered, though, was that King Saul was not particularly thrilled about being replaced as king. In fact, to the point that David spent the next, <coughs> excuse me, period of months literally on the run for, for his life from Saul. And on various occasions, he barely escaped and had the opportunity actually to kill Saul, but turned those down himself out of a respect for the kingship. Now, I think this is not, this wasn't exactly how David envisioned things working out. And he's very, very honest with God about his feelings on the subject, which he expresses in the 13th Psalm. Now, I'd like to read the first two verses of this again. But in a little, I won't try to reproduce what I think David was going through. But... <coughs> As I read these, envision what you think his facial expressions might have been like, what his tone of voice might have been, what emotions are coming to the surface. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? And day after day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? I envision David with this anguished look on his face. This, this tone of voice of utter desperation and helplessness. Think about all the emotions that are coming to the surface here in David's life. In fact, this was not the only psalm that was written during this point of David's life. Just a few over in Psalm 6, he gives us another picture of the anguish that he was feeling. In Psalm 6, in verse 2, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, O Lord. My bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long? Oh, Lord, how long? And then beginning in verse 6, we get this really vivid imagery, these figures of speech that describe the depth of his pain and anguish. I am worn out from my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. Now think about what... This is the lament section, obviously, of this psalm, where he pours out his heart to God. Think about the different emotions that David's expressing. What, what's he feeling? Feeling alone? Anguish? Frustration? Discouragement? Depression? 
I'm not sure I want to get a clinical view of what he might have been like at this point, but I think he was seriously depressed. I think he's also angry at God, maybe even exasperated with God for what seems to be an eternity of silence on God's, on God's behalf for him. I think he's feeling this, this incredible sense of helplessness, hopelessness. Uh, he puts it in the, the next part in, in verses three and four in the, in the petition part of this where he actually makes a request of God. It sort of continues the lament where he says, look on me and answer, the Lord my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. In other words, I'm at the end of my rope, Lord. I am fading fast here. And he is pleading with God to intervene. Or you get the sense that David, I mean, he's, he's a drowning man here. And if God doesn't intervene, he's going under for the last time. Emotionally, I think he is at his wit's end. And he expresses this, I think, this real sense of frustration and exasperation that God seems to be sitting silent while he's sort of tied a knot at the end of his rope and is barely holding on. Now, I think there's, there's an encouraging note on this. For one, I think that David felt, actually felt the freedom to express these kinds of things to God actually I think is a really healthy thing. It's not like we're we're hiding what's going on inside our lives from an omniscient God in the first place. But expressing those, those are sometimes feelings that we feel like we don't have permission to say to God. You know, it, and I think that David affirms here, and, and nowhere that I'm aware of is he ever condemned for saying these things to God. He's saying some pretty hard things to God here about how he's feeling and how he's processing what's going on in his life. And I think God recognizes that he's given David freedom to do that. In fact, I think there's a connection between the, the fact that David was so close to God. In fact, I think he's called, I think this is probably the reason why he's called the man after God's own heart. It, I don't think it was because of his sort of overwhelming moral virtue. You know, ask you know, Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite about those things. But I think it was because he felt this freedom to express to God who he was and where he was. In fact, I think just in general, I think it's, it's, it's hard to be close to someone that you don't feel like you have the freedom to be angry with. And I think this helps explain some of how he felt this closeness and intimacy that he had with God. And it's sort of the beginning, we get the beginnings here of, I think, what he affirms later on more explicitly in verses 5 and 6. So he asked God to deliver him. He asked God, you know, Lord, if you don't intervene and step in here, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done being able to cope with this on my own strength, with my own abilities, and if you don't intervene, I am finished. But then in verses 5 and 6, it suddenly shifts gears. <clears throat> With, with I, this is, I mean, this is a huge but in verse 5. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. The first time I read that, I thought to myself, how can that be in light of what he has just said in verses 1 and 2? I don't... I don't get how this is being worked out. And to be fair, I'm not sure David quite understood how this was all going to be worked out. Because I think he was probably quite a ways emotionally from being able to fully embrace what I think he is stating here as a statement of faith. He is stating and reaffirming his trust, which is part of the lament pattern where you're honest with God, you ask God for what you need, but then you ultimately affirm your trust and dependence on Him. In fact, I, in fact it's, not, it's not hard to read this in a way that almost sounds phony. It almost sounds like this Pollyanna view of God that's a, 
Somehow, if I just say the right things that I trust God, it's this statement of faith that will, you know, it's a cure-all that everything's going to be okay. And that wasn't true. I mean, David was still in the middle of all of this. But the assurance that he expressed was not intended to be a cure-all. It's a genuine expression of trust. Even though I'm, uh, it's not, a, not exactly clear how he worked this out all emotionally at the time. And I, I, would, I would suggest to you, it's not that once we trust God, the, you know, it all sort of works out how it all fits together becomes crystal clear. For example, other, other persons in the Old Testament, I think, had similar experience. Job, for example, was never told how what happened to him fit into God's overall plan and purpose for his life. In fact, Job was never given a cognitive explanation, a theological explanation for what God was doing in all of this. In fact, we know that his, their friends, his friend's explanation was incomplete at best, uh, if not just flat wrong. Um, but God never answer, really answers the cognitive question that Job was pressing on him. Instead, he gave, he gave him something a little different. Ecclesiastes echoes this same theme in numerous places throughout the book. For example, look at in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11, that he, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Likewise, chapter 8, verse 15, I'm sorry, 16, when I applied my mind to know wisdom, and to observe the labor that is done on earth, people getting no sleep day or night, then I saw all that God has done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun or this side of eternity. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend. And then similarly in 11.5, in 11, puts it like this in a vivid imagery. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. See, Job didn't get the overall big picture, but he got a picture of a trustworthy God to walk with him through the uncertainties of his life. In fact, I believe if he... If, if Job or any of us got the full overall plan for how everything that comes into our life fits into a coherent whole, we'd probably ask for plan B pretty quickly. Because I don't, I, I don't think we have quite the, the ability this side of eternity to, to, to choke down the plan that actually God has for us. That's why I think he reveals it a little bit at a time. See, I think this is what David's affirming in, in Psalm 13. That he has a certain God who's utterly trustworthy, who loves him without conditions to walk through uncertainty with him. I think that's what he means when he says, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. He's affirming he has a certain God who's completely trustworthy, who loves him and who is for him. But he didn't know how it was all going to work out. I suspect that there's a lot of what unfolded in First and Second Samuel that David didn't quite see coming and was caught off guard by some of that. Nor do we know how it's all going to work out. In fact, there are some things that we may never know this side of eternity how they will fit into a coherent whole for our lives. What we do know is that we have a God who is certain about whom we can be certain, he is trustworthy, that he loves us, and that he is for us. I'm not sure the Bible promises us all adequate reasons for why the things that happen to us do. The Bible promises us a person 
to walk with us through those uncertainties and ambiguities. Now, I don't exactly know how this is all going to work out culturally either. What I do know is that God is not up in heaven biting his nails because of the direction the culture and the political arena are going. In fact, I heard, I heard some people say after the election, some with real concerns about where the country is headed, they would say, don't give me this pious platitude that God's on his throne. As though simply saying that would alleviate all, all the concerns that people have. And I think sometimes people reacted to that uh, because it came sometimes with a lack of compassion and a lack of, and a lack of an ability to listen to some of the fears and anxieties that people have. But the Bible does not treat the idea that God is on his throne as a pious platitude. In fact, the Bible treats that as a very real truth and a very real source of comfort that is most often connected to real people in real life most, in most cases, who are marginalized. Look, for example, in Psalm 9, just a little bit over again during the same, the same time period in David's life. Beginning in verse 7, the Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. Now, here's the real life part. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for, Lord, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. It seems to me what we need in this particular moment culturally is if I could, if I could borrow the words from the author Trevin Wax in his forthcoming book, This Is Our Time, everyday myths in light of the gospel. What we need in this particular moment in our culture is what he describes as regaining our gospel bearings. I love that term. He puts it like this. Gospel bearings mean that we won't fall for a fabled myth of progress, but neither will we fall for the myth of decline, as if the world is now only discovering new depths of evil and injustice. A cursory study of history should disabuse us of the notion that we have arrived at a new stage of depravity. He goes on to put it like this. We are not sliding down a hill into the abyss. Neither are we climbing up a ladder into the heavens. The world is what it has always been, the place where principalities and powers array themselves against the living God and where King Jesus promises to return and reign. That's why, he continues, we must work to lift our heads up from our current moment, to listen to the words of the psalmist, to hear the laments of the prophets, recall the stories of our ancestors, visit our church fathers, and realize that spiritual struggle and being countercultural exiles is the norm, not the exception. He closes like this. The world is shaking, yes, but it's not shaking because of terrible evil, but the greatest good. The gospel of a crucified and risen king continues to transform hearts and lives as the shock wave from the resurrection ripple out across the world 2,000 years later. See, my hope this semester is that we can take steps toward regaining our gospel bearings. And that regardless of the uncertainty that we face culturally or institutionally, or that you might face personally, that we, we, can, we can regain our bearings by recognizing that we are connected to a certain God who walks with us through uncertain times. In my view, that's awfully good news to start a new semester.
Amen. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.